Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming out on what was a fairly dodgy weather day this morning. Um, my name's Terry Slevin. I'm with the Cancer Council. Uh, welcome to this latest in our series of Cancer Update presentations. Um, today's speaker is Professor John Emery. John is a Professor of General Practice at the University of Melbourne. I welcomed him home today. The reason I welcomed him home is John arrived in Perth in August um, 12 years ago uh, from his studies in Cambridge and took up the chair in general practice at the University of Western Australia and that's where the Cancer Council first established a relationship with John. And I'm told that within three days of his arrival in Perth in August 12 years ago, we had him wheeled out to do a talk. So it's a bit of a homecoming. Um, I've been involved with research projects with John. Um, he is uh, a very fine uh, researcher in the broad area of general practice as it relates specifically to cancer and in particular cancer early diagnosis. Uh, he's been a very successful uh, researcher within Australia winning large numbers of research grants and being very active in the research community helping us to find a way forward when it comes to the issue of finding cancer early which is why we've invited him to speak on the topic today. Uh, and please welcome John Emery. Thank you very much, Terry. Uh, always a pleasure to be back in Perth, and thank you very much to Cancer Council WA for inviting me here. Uh, this is where I work now. Um, this is the new Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre, and I put it up mainly just to show that the sun does sometimes shine in Melbourne. So I'm going to be talking particularly around uh, issues of early cancer diagnosis uh, with a focus on men. So why am I focusing on men? So men in Australia are more likely to have cancer. They're more likely to die of cancer. Although I have to say we, the chances of surviving cancer are improving. And so now two-thirds of people who diagnose with cancer will live at least five years. And so we have a growing number of people who are surviving long-term with cancer. The latest estimates, there are nearly 400,000 people who are now living with and beyond a cancer diagnosis. So survival is improving a lot. But uh, men often get a bit neglected in the discussions around cancer. The other thing to just recognise is that we have a growing uh, number of people affected by cancer and the projections are there'll be a 40% increase in the number of people newly diagnosed with cancer in the next 20 years. This is mainly because we're getting older. Uh, it's also related partly to cancer screening but the main issue is that we are living longer and that means that we are more likely to develop cancer. If we look at Western Australia, these are the figures for 2014. And again, just to illustrate why I'm focusing on men, men are more likely to develop cancer. These are the rates per 100,000, so 349 men per 100,000 versus 279 women. Um, and by the age of 75, you have a one in three chance as a man of having developed uh, some form of cancer, excluding non-melanoma skin cancer, whereas a woman, your chances are one in four. So that's why I'm focusing on men today. These are the types of cancer that men are more likely to experience. So prostate cancer, perhaps not surprising, is the commonest cancer that men experience, and then followed by melanoma, bowel cancer, and lung cancer. But it's important to remember that lung cancer, even though it's not as common, it remains the commonest cause of cancer death in men. And this is mainly because it uh, often presents later and therefore is harder to treat. Uh, men's health is re increasingly recognised as a very important issue. This is a recent um, uh, whole uh, journal uh, um, that was uh, focused just on men's health aimed at Australian GPs. One of the reasons that uh, we're concerned about men's health is that men just visit their GP much less often. These are the uh, number of times, on average, uh, people visit their GP in Australia. And uh, you'll see 
Before the age of 15, if I can get this to work, uh, before the age of 15, uh, boys are slightly more likely to go and have uh, GP visits. But once you stop having your mother or father taking you along to the doctor, uh, you uh, rapidly uh, become a much less frequent visitor. Of course, you, it becomes more common as you get older, but even in uh, people over 65, there are still more women visiting their GP than men. Men ne- neglect their health more. So that's why we're focusing on men today. And so these are some of the questions I'm going to cover today. So how can we diagnose cancer earlier, and particularly focusing on some of the common cancers that I mentioned? Which cancer tests for men are worth having? And which symptoms should men look out for that might be uh, possible symptoms of cancer? So there's a lot of interest in cancer screening and the ability to try and pick up uh, cancer earlier uh, through various screening tests. And there are lots of cancer tests being promoted directly to the general public. So from tumour markers, so these are blood tests uh, for for various cancers, having total body scans, uh, having your genes tested, Um, and going to have various scans done of your skin. But the question is, which of these tests are actually worth having and which are actually not very helpful tests? Um, And this is a real problem for for consumers to work out which are the ones that actually uh, you should think about and which are the ones that are actually probably not worth spending your money on. I wanted to highlight an important difference between different types of cancer test. So there are screening tests. These are tests that are done for people who are well and have no symptoms at the time. And then there are diagnostic tests. These are the sorts of tests that your doctor might order when you go and see them with symptoms. And I'm going to focus mainly on cancer screening tests today um, uh, and uh, just a little bit about uh, the sorts of symptoms that you should look out for to go and see your doctor who might then go on to order some diagnostic tests. But there are some particular challenges around cancer screening tests that I wanted to, uh, to, um, to discuss first. So cancer screening is a bit like a fishing trip in some way. So uh, here we are in the sea, and uh, this is our fisherman who is the person ordering a cancer screening test. And there are lots of different cancers in, in the sea. Even if we just think these are all different prostate cancers, not every prostate cancer is the same. And so you might um, catch a sardine. So this is like a cancer that is slow growing. And actually, you may never have known about it. Um, It may never have caused you symptoms, but it will just slowly grow there and not cause you any problems. There are also some cancers which are much more aggressive, faster growing, And these are the ones that you want screening tests to really diagnose early and pick up. So this feeds into questions about which cancer screening tests are actually worth having. So these are some of the questions in favour of a particular cancer screening test. So do they detect those serious cancers early? And does detecting those serious cancers lead to fewer deaths from that cancer if they're found early through the screening test. So those are the sorts of things that you want a screening test to do. But you then have to balance that out against detecting some of those more slow-growing cancers, the ones that uh, may not actually need treatment at all because they grow so slowly that they're never going to cause you any harm. And if if your screening test then picks up those slow-growing cancers but you then end up having them treated. What are the side effects of those treatment, both physical side effects and psychological effects of being diagnosed with a cancer? And then what are the costs of treating those slow-growing cancers? So both um, costs, put your out-of-pocket costs, costs taking time off work, and of course, uh, increasingly we have to think about uh, from a tax point, uh, point of view, are this, is this the best way to be spending health care Uh, dollars, which are increasingly uh, under pressure. So when we're thinking about cancer screening tests, we want a screening uh, test that's very good at this, picking up those more serious cancers early that will save lives, but but, uh, balanced out against hopefully not picking up too many slow-growing cancers that don't need treatment. So I'm going to first start talking about uh, bowel cancer screening. Uh, I recently turned 50, and uh, 
at certain birthdays, the federal government sends you this kit in the post as a birthday present. It's the National Bowel Cancer Screening Kit, and I'm just going to show you a short video about what this kit is all about. By 2020, people aged between 50 and 74 will receive a free National Bowel Cancer Screening Kit every two years. The kit is designed to detect minute traces of blood in your bowel movements and makes it easy to safely and discreetly collect a small stool sample in the convenience of your own home. Each kit contains a full instruction booklet, a Ziploc bag, two flushable collection sheets, two sampling sticks and sterile collection tubes, two identification stickers for the collection tubes, two transportation tubes and a prepaid envelope and checklist with which to return your samples. You need to collect two samples ideally on two consecutive days. On day one, take one of the flushable paper mats and lay it inside your toilet. This will catch your bowel movement. Next, use the tip of the blue sampling stick to collect a small sample of your stool no bigger than a rice grain by dragging it back and forth through the bowel movement. Then, push the sampling stick into one of the collection tubes and you can now flush your toilet as normal. Next, fill in the details on one of the identification stickers and stick it around the collection tube. Finally, place the vial in one of the transportation tubes and store it somewhere cool, away from sunlight. On day two, repeat the whole process using the red sampling stick and collection tube. Then, using your checklist, ensure everything has been completed. Seal both samples and your signed participant details form in the prepaid envelope. Please mail it as soon as possible, preferably from a post office to help avoid any heat that may affect your sample. Remember, a positive test result does not mean that you have bowel cancer. It simply means that you have traces of blood in your bowel movement, which may be due to conditions other than cancer. However, if your result is positive, you should discuss it with your doctor. For any more information, call this number. So that's the bowel cancer screening kit that gets sent to you in the post Um, and uh, I really wanted to present some of the evidence about why we think this is such a useful test and why the government has invested so much money in sending these kits to people from the ages of 50 and out through to 74. As as that uh, video said, uh, this is now being rolled out so by 2020 these kits will be sent every two years to people in the post Um, And so this is the evidence about why this is such an effective uh, test. And it's based on outcomes from the National Bowel Screening Programme. So if you imagine, first of all, we have 100,000 people and they choose not to do the bowel cancer screening test. Over an 18-month period, 306 people will be diagnosed with bowel cancer and of those, 60 people will die from that bowel cancer. If instead that 100,000 people chose to do the FOBT test, then there'll be 7,300 who will get a positive test um, result from uh, doing the kit. And they'll be asked to uh, go on and have a colonoscopy where they have a camera that uh, looks into your bowel to see if there are any cancers in the bowel. And so there'll be 7,300 who will have that colonoscopy there are some potential harms from having a colonoscopy. And they are mainly of having what's called a perforation, where it punctures the bowel, and also bleeding from the bowel as well. So there will be a small number of people. There will be five people who have a perforation and ten people who have a bleed from the result of the colonoscopy. But there will be 260 people who have a bowel cancer diagnosed early, and only 12 of those people over an 18-month period will die from that bowel cancer. So these are the people who benefited through early detection of their bowel cancer. These will be the number of people, so just over 92,000 people, who have a negative test. Now, no screening test is perfect, and there will be some people, and that will be, in this case, 46 people, who, although they had a negative test, over the next 18 months will be diagnosed with a bowel cancer, and of those, uh, seven people will die from that bowel cancer. And so this is the balance. So if you have no screening, 60 people, even over an 18-month period, will die from bowel cancer. But if they'd had the FOBT, then there are only 19 people who die, but with a small number of people experiencing complications from colonoscopy. So this is the rationale uh, for why we think detecting bowel cancer early through the faecal occult blood test, that's what FOBT stands for, is such an important test. 
At the moment, though, uh, there are very low rates of participation. Overall, only 37% of people who get sent the kit actually return the kit. And these rates are even lower in men uh, compared to women, and that's what this slide is demonstrating. As you'll see, older people are more likely to complete the test, but at each age group, there are lower rates of participation by men than women. So we think this is a really important test uh, for men to be actually uh, thinking about and actually uh, responding to when they receive the kit because it really does uh, improve your chances of survival from bowel cancer. What about colonoscopy instead, though, some people will ask. Uh, I was um, in an American airport recently looking for a birthday card for my wife's 50th, and I came across this, uh, this birthday card. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I didn't actually give it to her, fortunately. <laughs> but I did buy it because I thought it's just a really good example of how, per certainly in the States, colonoscopy is very widely used as an alternative screening test. So rather than doing the fecal occult blood test, they go straight ahead, straight, ahead, straight ahead and have a colonoscopy instead, which is a much more invasive procedure. And a lot of Australians do just the same. There are a lot of people in Australia who, rather than do the FOBT, uh, go ahead and have a colonoscopy instead. And this is why we don't think this is such a good idea. So these are the same numbers that I just showed you uh, for people who do the FOBT. If instead 100,000 people all had a colonoscopy instead, then 291 people will have that bowel cancer detected, and again over an 18-month period, 13 of them will die from that cancer. There'll be 99,709 who have a negative colonoscopy, of whom 15 will develop bowel cancer and two will die from that. But the really important thing is here, all the complications of those colonoscopies. There'll be 68 people who have a perforation. There'll be 140 people who experience a, a bleed from the colonoscopy, and eight people will actually die from the colonoscopy. Colonoscopy is not a benign procedure, and this is why we don't recommend it to the whole population. So the, ba the tally you see here is actually, if you uh, offer colonoscopy to everybody as a screening test, you'll actually kill more people than if you do an FOBT kit first. And you'll also lead to many more complications. So this is the rationale for offering the FOBT kit to people who are at average risk of bowel cancer. There are some people who, for whom colonoscopy is recommended, and these are people who have a significant family history of bowel cancer, where actually the balance uh, flips and the numbers uh, go more towards in favour of people using colonoscopy um, uh, if you're at higher risk. And the sorts of family history you need to have to make it worth having a colonoscopy uh, instead of an FOBT are here. So having a, a parent or um, a sibling who was diagnosed with bowel cancer before 55, or having two first-degree relatives, or one first and one second-degree relative. These are the sorts of types of uh, family history that put you at a high enough risk of bowel cancer to warrant having a colonoscopy. But we know that there are a lot of Australians who are going straight to having colonoscopy, even though they don't have a family history like that, and are actually putting themselves at greater risk than if they instead use the FOBT kit that gets sent to them in the post. It's important, though, to recognise that even though we have a national bowel screening programme, that the majority of people diagnosed with bowel cancer actually um, are diagnosed because they develop symptoms. And uh, these are some of the important symptoms of bowel cancer that people need to look out for and if they're present, they should go and discuss with their doctor. So blood in your poo, uh, uh, and then changes in your bowel habits. So mainly um, becoming looser and more frequent, um, or just changing the pattern. But over a period of weeks, if this is a, an ongoing problem, so if this, these symptoms last for more than four weeks, then they're important symptoms that you need to go and discuss with your doctor. And then these are some of the other symptoms listed here. It's important to realise that actually most of the time people with these symptoms won't have bowel cancer because they'll often have a, a much more common, benign explanation for their symptoms. 
But these are important symptoms that people need to recognise that if they have them, they should go and see their doctor early. And there's more information on this Cancer Council, uh, Find Cancer Early website about, this, uh, about these symptoms. So I'm going to now move on to the issue of prostate cancer screening. Uh, it gets talked out about a lot in the context of men's health, and, uh, um, and, uh, and it remains a controversial subject about whether or not it's worth actually having a PSA test um, as, um, as a screening test, so in people who don't have symptoms. Because this has been so controversial and different interpretations of the evidence around the, the benefits of PSA testing, uh, the Cancer Council Australia and Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia got together a group of, of experts around the country to actually look at all the evidence around the benefits of using PSA to detect prostate cancer early. And they came up with these guidelines this year and recommendations about who might be offered the PSA testing as a way of detecting prostate cancer early. One of the good things in these recommendations from a man's point of view is that a rectal examination is no longer actually recommended as part of a testing for prostate cancer. The PSA, which is a blood test, um, is actually uh, good enough on its own um, as a screening test. And so uh, a lot of men will be very glad to hear this news. The key recommendation, though, from these guidelines is here, is that men who are at average risk of prostate, prostate cancer, those are people who don't have a family history of the condition, they need to have a discussion around the benefits and harms of testing and before they actually decide to have a PSA test. And I'll go on to explain why that's such an important concept. This is not like having your cholesterol ton. You need to understand that this is a more complex decision to make before you actually have a PSA test ordered. If you are going to have a discussion, then it's, uh, this is a test that's principally aimed at men who are aged 50 to 69. Um, and so this is the core group that we think should be at least having a discussion with their GP to understand what the benefits might be, but also the potential harms of having a PSA test. So why am I making um, such a fuss about this balance between harms and benefits? So this is another diagram to try and help explain this. And so again, what we're imagining here are a group of men here, a thousand men who have... PSA testing over an 11-year period. And what would happen to them if they didn't have PSA testing compared to what would happen to them if they did have PSA testing? So this is the group of men who don't have a PSA test. During an 11-year period, five men will die from prostate cancer. Another 190 men will die from something else. And then there will be 55 men who are, develop symptoms and are diagnosed with prostate cancer. And that leaves 782 men living perfectly happily without uh, prostate cancer. For those who then choose to have a PSA test, there will still be four out of these five men who unfortunately will die from the prostate cancer. But there will be one man whose life may be saved as, as a result of having that PSA test. There will still be the same 190 men who will die of some other condition, uh, the same 55 men who develop symptoms and are diagnosed with prostate cancer, and then 715 men who are alive with, with, uh, without prostate cancer. So that means that doing all this extra PSA testing, you diagnose an, an extra 67 men with, with prostate cancer but only one man will actually have his life saved through having the prostate cancer test. There are also consequences of having a PSA test. So if you have a PSA test raised, then uh, you will normally repeat the test, and if it's still raised, then you'll be referred to see a urologist to have what's uh, called a prostate cancer biopsy, where they take a sample from your prostate gland. And there are complications of having that. So 87 of these 1,000 men who've had a PSA test will have a biopsy, but will not be found to have prostate cancer. So those are what are called false positive results from the screening test. And 28 men 
will actually experience side effects from the prostate cancer biopsy. And that's sufficient to need to seek um, health care. And some of those will actually have uh, serious enough side effects to require hospitalisation for treatment of the consequences of having that prostate ca- uh, biopsy, even though they didn't have prostate cancer. And then this is the, what I was talking about earlier. You, PSA picks up a lot of slow-growing cancers that would not have caused you any problems. So it will pick up 37 men who have a slow-growing cancer, and those are what are called over-diagnosis. So these are the cancers that are the slow-growing ones that could have happily lived with without even knowing about them, wouldn't have caused you any problems at all. And then there are 25 men who, once they've been told that they have one of these cancers, uh, choose to be treated. And so that's what's called over-treatment. So these are the men who, once they've been diagnosed, although it's a slow-growing cancer, they feel that they have to have it treated, um, and then they can experience the consequences of treatment. So if those men who have uh, treat, uh, treatment, there will be up to 10 men who will experience long-term side effects of that treatment, including impotence, urinary incontinence, or bowel problems. So these are the side effects of treatment. And there will also, if you think of 2,000 men now, there will be one man who will have a heart attack as a result of the treatment. And so this is why prostate cancer testing is a much more complicated decision because you have to weigh up the potential benefits, which might be, you might be the man whose life is saved from prostate cancer, but you're actually more likely to be one of these people who are diagnosed with a slow-growing prostate cancer and suffer the consequences of the treatment and the side effects of treatment. And this is why it's a much more complicated decision to have than I think many men actually realise. So... I think the first message for you, I think, is don't rush into having a PSA test. And importantly, make sure that your doctor doesn't actually add a PSA test onto other blood tests without actually discussing it with you first. We know that this occurs, and we think that um, actually, uh, because this is such a complex decision, uh, you need to actually discuss the implications and how much you value the possibility of early diagnosis against the possible consequences of having treatment of a, of a condition that might not have actually caused you any, any harm in the first place. So talk to your doctor about having a PSA test. Try and understand, think about what the consequences might be um, before you actually just go ahead and have the test done. So I'm going to go now to talk a little bit about skin cancer. So there are various types of skin cancer. Uh, The commonest is what's called a basal cell uh, carcinoma. You may hear about it being called a BCC. And this accounts for two-thirds of all cancers. They're often very slow-growing cancers. They tend not to spread, but they they just grow locally um, into the skin. And they're often on the face, and this is a a, a sort of typical picture of of a BCC on somebody's nose. Then there are slightly less common uh, SCCs, squamous cell carcinomas, and this is an SCC. Again, often on the face and hands of people. These sometimes spread and uh, are therefore potentially uh, um, more serious than BCCs. Of course, the cancer that we worry about much more is melanoma. This is a much more serious uh, cancer, potentially. It's much less common. It only counts for about 2% of all skin cancers in Australia. Um, But as you remember, it is still, after prostate cancer, it's the second commonest cancer in men. Um, It's the most serious because it can spread if it's not diagnosed early and spread to other organs, and uh, and that's why it's uh, potentially an important uh, uh, cancer to detect early. There are some important ways when you're looking at your skin to um, uh, look at moles um, and... uh, decide whether or not they might be a possible melanoma. And so there's this simple mnemonic called the ABCD rules uh, that you can apply if you look at um, any uh, mole on your skin and to see if if your mole has any of these features. So the first is asymmetry. So this is um, a a melanoma, and uh, you can imagine that there is no way that you can draw a line through this that would make 
um, it a symmetrical lesion. So this is an asymmetrical lesion. It, it's, uh, there is no way can you draw a line through it to make it look equal on both sides of the line. An irregular border. So again, this is another melanoma, and you can see that it's, a very, it's not a nice round shape. It has ne- uh, these sort of craggy edges, so an irregular border. C is for color, so having more than one color within the mole. So you'll see here there's a dark patch here and then a light patch here. So um, different colors within a mole, another important sign. And then finally, a mole that's growing, and uh, particularly moles that are more than six millimeters in diameter are another important feature that this might be a melanoma. So these are the things to look out for. And if you think that, you're, uh, um, that you've seen a, 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 um, a mole that has any of these features, then you should go and see your GP and have it checked out. There are, of course, lots of advertisements to go and have skin checks. And the question is really, who is it who might benefit most from having regular skin checks, whether it's from your GP or from one of the uh, skin cancer clinics, uh, of which there are many, particularly uh, in Western Australia. And again, the, the problem with skin cancer screening is you have to weigh up the benefits of picking up serious cancers early, some of those melanomas, picking those up early, um, and uh, does that actually reduce the number of people dying from melanoma? against picking up slower-growing cancers that may not have needed treatment and all the side effects of having skin excisions and the costs of having skin excisions. Um, And at the moment, there isn't good evidence uh, to support offering skin uh, screening, so offering full examination of your skin to every adult person uh, because the evidence uh, uh, isn't here to show that you'll actually save people people's lives from melanoma through offering lots of um, skin checks. But there are probably some people who are more likely to benefit from having regular skin checks. And these, again, are people who are at higher risk of melanoma. The, the group who are most likely to benefit are people who've actually had a melanoma previously because they are at, at significantly higher risk of having a second melanoma. So those people should be having their skin checked every six months. And then there's another group uh, who may benefit from annual uh, checks of their skin. So certainly people who have had um, a non-melanoma skin cancer, so a BCC or an SCC, then they probably uh, should be considering having their skin checked annually. Similarly, if you have a family history, so a parent or a brother or sister who's had melanoma, then again you're at higher risk of melanoma, and again it may be worth having an annual skin check. These are um, what are called actinic keratoses. So they're a marker of uh, sun damage to your skin. You can often feel them on your skin if you have them. They feel a bit sort of crusty and hard, and they're sort of raised uh, red areas, but they they have a sort of crustiness to them, a bit like you have a scab on your skin. Uh, Again, they're a a marker of sun damage to your skin, uh, which may put you at higher risk of melanoma. And then finally, a sort of cluster of of features that, um, so having a fair complexion, fair hair, blue eyes, um, having lots of moles, so more than 100 moles, and then having lots of um, previous sunburns as a child, which, of course, in Western Australia, a lot of people will have experienced. That combination of factors, again, probably puts you at higher risk and therefore more likely to benefit from annual skin checks. But I guess the bottom line message is not everybody needs to be having their skin checked um, on a regular basis. And only people who've had a melanoma before need to be doing it every six months. And then finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about lung cancer screening. uh, Because this is a a topic that's uh, gained a lot of publicity recently following a large American trial of uh, CT scanning. So this is a a CT scanner here, and this is a a CT scan of uh, your lungs. Now again, lung cancer screening has been thought about not as something that you might offer to all adults, but only to people who are at high risk of lung cancer. And the people who are at high risk of lung cancer are uh, older people, so um, people over 55 is the group that they've thought about offering this in, but who have smoked for a long period of time. So they need to have smoked for what's called 
at least uh, uh, 20 pack years. So that's the equivalent of smoking 20 cigarettes a day, every day for 20 years. So these are people who are really long-term heavy smokers. And that's who they have tested various approaches to offering uh, lung cancer screening in. So one of the early approaches that was uh, taken was looking at doing chest X-rays. Uh, so doing a lung a chest X-ray on people uh, who are heavy smokers on a regular basis. Now, again, this is an important issue around cancer screening tests. So chest X-rays are not very good at picking up uh, small lung cancers. And so this is the problem of false negative tests with a, with a cancer screening test. Um, uh, a chest X-ray just won't pick up very early lung cancers. So you have what appears to be a normal chest X-ray, even though there is a small lung cancer growing. So that's the problem of false negative tests with lung cancer screening using a chest X-ray. But the more recent trials have used um, what's called low-dose CT scans. Now, they have the opposite problem. They're so sensitive, they pick up lots of other things as well. So... This is um, actually a lung nodule. It's not a lung cancer. But CT scans are very good at picking up nodules. And it's sometimes difficult to work out whether, when you see this whether it's an early lung cancer or whether it's, it's a benign nodule. And so this is the problem of false positive tests. So a bit like we said in prostate cancer, you end up having to do lots of prostate biopsies for people who don't actually have prostate cancer. They've just got a raised PSA. With lung cancer screening, you again, you have the problem of lots of false positive tests because it picks up these uh, nodules and you then either have to keep doing more CT scans to see if, um, if it's growing or you may end up having to have quite an invasive biopsy to actually see if it's a lung cancer. So that's the, the problem currently with uh, lung cancer screening is how we ba balance out all the extra false positives against the fact that there is some benefit for those people who do have a lung cancer that's detected early through CT screening. So the Australian government have what's called a standing committee on screening where, again, they look at the, uh, the existing evidence and weigh up, again, the balance of benefits, how many lives might be saved through use, using the screen test. But what are the downsides? And the big downside, as I said, with CT screening for lung cancer is, is all the false positives, all these nodules that you pick up that you're not quite sure how to manage. So at the moment, the Australian government position is that lung cancer screening using CT is not recommended, even in heavy smokers. There's further work going on to see if there are ways to, um, uh, to work out which of these are real lung cancers and which are benign ones. And so this evidence is, is still evolving, and it may well be that at some point in the future, uh, the Standing Committee on Screening will review new evidence um, and that we might start offering screening, in particularly in certain high-risk groups. But at the moment, the current position, even though there are a number of radiology clinics in Western Australia and across Australia beginning to promote this as a screening test, the current national recommendations is that uh, the, uh, that this is not a recommended test. So it remains, therefore, to uh, try and identify lung cancer early through early detection of people with symptoms. And again, this is uh, a summary of some of the really important symptoms to look out for uh, that might be a possible lung cancer. So most people will know about the importance of coughing up blood as a, an important possible symptom of lung cancer. And if that just happens once, then you really should go immediately to see your doctor. Again, often it will, or most of the time, it will not be due to lung cancer, but it's a very important symptom that you need to go and see your doctor about. And then some of these other th symptoms. So a, a cough that carries on for uh, at least four weeks. Or if you have a chronic cough, a lot, a lot of people, particularly if they are former smokers or current smokers, will, will of course have a, a smoker's cough. But changes to that cough, uh, again, can be important to uh, look out for. Repeated chest infections, becoming more short of breath, feeling more tired, 
Again, maybe subtle symptoms of lung cancer. And then unexplained weight loss. This is an important symptom for many cancers. Uh, if you recall, it was also on the list for bowel cancer. It's an important symptom to look out for because it may be a symptom of a, of a, a variety of cancers and that requires further investigation. And then persistent pain in the chest or shoulder. And again, as I say, the, uh, if you go to find cancer early, uh, there's a lot more information. There are video clips about this. And I'm going to now... Um, Oh. Yeah. So I'll, I'll show you a video in a moment around uh, uh, from that site. But before I do that, I just wanted to summarise what I think really are the, check, the tests that are worth having. And of course, the gold medal, we're uh, in Olympic mode, we have to think about the medal winners, and that has to be for bowel screening. The FOBT test, of all the screening tests that we currently have available, is the most effective test in terms of early detection as I say, men are not using it, and nor are women, to be fair, but overall we need to be encouraged to actually go and do the test when it arrives in the post. Prostate cancer and skin cancer, they're in sort of amber because I think, as I say, they may be useful, particularly for people who are at higher risk, but you need to go and have a discussion with your doctor, particularly around PSA, and then if you uh, may have... Um, uh, various factors that put you at higher risk of skin cancer, then it may be worthwhile having regular skin cancer checks. And then finally, we just have to wait for further evidence around lung cancer screening. But certainly for now, it's not currently recommended to detect um, lung cancer unless, again, you have symptoms. And that leads me on. Finally, I wanted to show you another video clip that was developed um, uh, by the Cancer Council. The bathroom is a good place to look for cancer and find it early. If you do find it early enough, there's a better chance of doing something about it. Look for blood in your poo. A nagging cough for unusual weight loss. And check for blood in your pee. An unusual lump or swelling in any part of your body. Changes in a spot on your skin or any other changes in your body that are not normal for you. If you're over 40 and have any of these changes, tell your doctor. Find out more at findcancerearly.com.au campaign that was run as part of a large uh, rural campaign in Western Australia to raise awareness of symptoms. It's on the Find Cancer Early website uh, within uh, Cancer Council WA. Um, and again, I think it's just highlighting that although we have a number of screening tests available, the majority of cancers will still be found because of cancer symptoms. And so it's important that people know about which symptoms to look for and when to go and see your doctor early. As I say, most of the symptoms, even on that video, most of the time they have a much more common benign cause. But these are still early warning signs um, and uh, that you need to go and have checked out. Now, I know I've gone through a lot of information in a relatively short time. Um, the, uh, the slides and I think the audio from this uh, will, will be available uh, through the Cancer Council Update Series website. I'm not quite sure how soon that will be, but uh, they, they will eventually be available if you want to uh, go back and look at some of the pictures and images that I've shown you. Um, but uh, for now, I'm very happy to take questions, so thank you. Thanks, John. That is a fascinating run through what is an extraordinary amount of science behind all of those. So, as always, John has done an outstanding job. But um, questions, uh, and if you could actually hold, because of that audio tape that John mentioned, if you could hold your question until we get a microphone in your hand, that means that we can actually capture your question as part of the audio that either you or other people can view later on our website. And it's about a week or two before, before we can get that up. So, any questions? Uh, yeah, a couple of those tests there, they had an upper age limit on. One was 69, I think the other one's 74. Does this imply that once you pass that age, you shouldn't worry so much? Uh, that's a very good question. So uh, I might start with the PSA test to begin with. Uh, 
And the, the national guidelines that I mentioned, they, they do talk about this issue. Um, and the problem about carrying on having PSA tests beyond 70 is uh, that you're more likely to experience the harms of the treatment because they're the immediate consequences of having a prostate cancer diagnosed early. And you're less likely to actually experience the benefits because the benefits don't kick in to at least seven years after you've had the test. So you need to be, be sure that you're going to live at least another seven years before you're going to experience any benefit from having a PSA test. And so they, look, they did various modelling to look at um, the balance between uh, the sort of at what point is it, does it stop becoming a useful test. Uh, now, of course, uh, men are living much longer, and um, uh, if you look at Australian data now, um, by the time you reach the age of 83, you still have a 50% chance of living another seven years in Australia. Uh, we're living an awfully long time now. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, uh, but that's part of the balance. Uh, and so men over 70, they can still be offered the PSA test, but they need to recognise that uh, if they are diagnosed with prostate cancer, then they will experience the side effects long before they might experience any benefit. They might be that one person who, uh, whose life is saved from prostate cancer or extended, but they will experience all the consequences of treatment much earlier. And so that's where the current thinking is that... Um, uh, if you, you, the, the core group who are most likely to benefit from a PSA test are aged 50 to 69. In terms of bowel cancer screening, the same sort of logic has been applied. Uh, so the, the um, test is, off, is uh, offered to people up to the age of 74, um, again, based on as a part of a national screening program, they have to work out at what age overall you stop offering um, a, a test. And uh, and so they've gone, and again, you need uh, to live for actually several years as a whole uh, to actually experience the benefits. Although I did show some early data that even by 18 months, you're beginning to see benefits of early detection. Um, but, but again, the same, uh, the same logic has been applied to when it, uh, they stop sending you the kit at 74. There may still be benefit for some people of carrying on, um, and that's a discussion to be had with your individual GP. But in terms of the national programme, then they stop sending it at 74. Good job. It's, it's good having a do like this all the time. Uh, I, I went and saw my uro urology uh, specialist, and she was, we, we're trying to work, work out a path. Like if, if your PSA is uh, over th three, and she was sort of suggesting, look, you keep on monitoring your PSA and, and every six months to a year you, you do the digital from a, ideally a small Chinese doctor. <laughs> uh, it, when do you, what, like if you get to four or five, and, but then sometimes you go, you go back down again, when, when do you start um, going, thinking about the next step, the biopsy, which can be, have troubles like we saw. The other two are very gentle, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. I think this is tricky. So uh, from a general practice point of view, the recommendation is that if you have uh, one PSA test above three, then you repeat that test again after about between one and three months. Because PSA varies a lot. So the, the level of your PSA varies just naturally on a daily basis by about 15%. Um, and that's part of the problem with PSA as well. So if you have one raised test and then it gets repeated at three months, they'll often do another test as well, could your free to total ratio, which gives a bit more information as well. Um, and, uh, and based on the results of that, then that's when people get referred on to see a urologist. The urologist will then do a rectal exam because uh, from a specialist point of view, that does provide further information um, in addition to the results of those blood tests. Um, uh, and then it's a matter of, uh, of then uh, they will decide whether your levels are raised high enough to actually warrant going ahead to do an, um, a prostate bi biopsy at that point. Or they, well, it depends partly on your age, and so they will often look at age-specific cutoffs. 
Yeah, I can't tell you exactly what your cutoff would be for 56, but the laboratory presents um, a range, range, range of, a, of PSAs and um, that will inform the, your urology, the urologist's decision as to whether it's worth having a biopsy at that point. Sometimes they will also, uh, they're beginning to look at the use of MRI as well to inform that decision about whether and where you might biopsy. So it is a more complex decision um, that's often made by, by your specialist. Um, uh, I'm afraid I'm not a urologist, <laughs> um, uh, uh, but, and, and urology practice, again, um, varies a little bit. But the national guidelines, again, that I've flagged, does have a whole section that's informing urological practice about when at what level of PSA, and uh, p- particularly based on your age-specific uh, cutoff of PSA, that it is worthwhile going on to have a biopsy. And again, as I showed, there are side effects of biopsy, and that's why often they won't rush into doing a biopsy. They may just continue to monitor your PSA to see what it's doing over a, over a three- to six-month period before they take that next step. But I can't give you a definitive answer of what your PSA should be, I'm afraid. Out of interest, I got my PSA tested by two different uh, uh, organisations mm. within an hour, and it was it was funny. One, one, there were different readings. Mm. Any yeah. comments? <laughs> yeah, uh, so <laughs> uh, um, that you can get again a natural variation just through error. In terms of uh, any test, will have a degree of error between the the actual value. That, um, so there'll be a plus and minus about just, which is just a, a statistical issue about how accurate the test is. But then there is also this natural variation in your PSA level that occurs. Um, uh, uh, and so even uh, within a few hours, you might just have some natural variation in your PSA level. As I say, on a daily basis, a 15% difference in PSA is quite large. Uh, so it's, it's not that the labs were wrong. Um, uh, the, the, the one other thing that some urologists say is that they tend to stick with a particular lab because the, some labs use slightly different um, tests to, to do PSA. And so if you are having your PSA monitored, then it's worth using the same lab on a regular basis so that they're using the same um, what's called assay. Yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, for the information that you've presented. My question's about melanoma. Hmm. Um, I'm just curious, when the effect is seen on the skin, is that a result of something that's happened underneath the skin? Hmm. Yeah, so the, the changes that um, I showed on those slides reflect what is going on at a slightly deeper level within the skin. And, and it's where the melanoma cells are starting to invade into the skin and spread. And so it is. Uh, so what you're seeing uh, with the naked eye uh, is a consequence of the growth of, of the melanoma within the mole. And so these darker patches is where the melanoma is growing, uh, and similarly here. So it's not the whole thing is a melanoma. This is the bit that's the melanoma and where it's growing uh, into deeper into the skin. Yeah. So perhaps in future it will be able to be detected earlier in a different location before it gets to that point, is that? So, um, uh, so these are, some of the pictures I've shown here are of melanomas that have probably been there for a while. What we're trying to do is people looking out for symptoms that, uh, that are early so that they can be then looked at. Uh, the doctors will often use something called demoscopy, which is a, it's a handheld imaging device, uh, which allows them to look at much higher uh, magnification for some more subtle changes that they can see in the skin, uh, which we know, um, if, if a doctor's been trained in interpreting those, is a very effective way at, of um, assessing a mole. And so often when people have skin checks, um, uh, uh, a doctor will use a dermatoscope to look at, in more detail at particular moles that they're concerned about because that gives you more information where you can really start to see more subtle changes that you can't see with the naked eye and that's a, a key part of sort of earlier detection yeah, Thank you, I, I was just thinking that if it's aggressive at that point there must have been a point 
somewhere in the body yes. where it was less aggressive. Thank yeah, you very that's much. Right. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, it just uh, it seems like possibly um, from your uh, presentation that um, possibly visits to the doctor actually could be quite dangerous just from <laughs> what you were saying. So um, yeah. uh, I don't know if that's uh, an appropriate interpretation. But I was just wondering, in terms of skin uh, cancers, um, are people that have suffered... Um, full thickness, third degree burns to say 15% or so of the body, are they more susceptible uh, to these sorts of cancers or less susceptible maybe because they might be more protective of their, their skin? Uh, I'm not aware that they're at high risk. Terry, I, I can't think of any studies where I've actually seen them look at that particular issue though. Mm. There's nothing that I'm no, I know you're another. Yeah. No. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, uh, uh, I've looked, we've recently looked at all the studies of what are called uh, models that look at all the different factors that predict your risk of melanoma, and we didn't come across any models that accounted for skin burn. Obviously, childhood sunburn is a different factor, but any type of burn, I, uh, I haven't seen that reported in any of the literature. I might come back to your comment about doctors being dangerous. Because <laughs> in a way, that's sort of part of what I'm trying to get across, is that there are some tests that are dangerous. And uh, this is in the context of, uh, in, in the US, there's um, a program called Too Much Medicine. And in Australia, it's being called Choosing Wisely. And it's about trying to get people to understand that there are some tests that are actually potentially do more harm than good. Uh, and that people need to understand that um, that uh, while uh, you may be offered some tests, they not, may not necessarily always be in your best interest. Colonoscopy is a really good example of that. We have a lot of people having colonoscopies without understanding the potential harms, um, and for people who probably don't need it, and they'd be much better off having an FOBT. Right. And just um, lastly, if I, I could ask... Um I know of somebody that's uh, recently had a, um, a procedure where they've had a, the, a part of the prostate uh, gland cut mm -hmm. um, to alleviate the issues of frequent mm, uh, yep. ur urination uh, issues. Um, do those procedures present uh, side effects or problems? They can do. So that's usually done for people with what's called benign enlargement of the prostate uh, for, to treat their uh, symptoms of often having to go to the toilet a lot and uh, having to rush and so on. Um, there are, again, potential side effects of that surgery as well, um, including uh, impotence. So the, the risks are much less than having your whole prostate gland removed because what they are doing in that surgery is, is removing the sort of inner core of your prostate gland. So the side effects of that are much less than having your whole prostate gland removed, which is the treatment for prostate cancer. Okay. That looks like we've worked through the question. So what I might do then is, firstly, um, first, I, I will observe that you got all the right questions. So well done on that, because the key and important and challenging questions are actually the ones you ask. So... Congratulations. Um, but I, I will invite you to thank John for what I think is a very thorough, very accessible and very worthwhile coverage of a complex area. So please give John a round of applause. Uh, now, before you go, a couple of things. You've got an evaluation form, which we handed you on the way in. We'd welcome your thoughts about the kind of topics you'd like to see covered. Uh, also, if you want to provide us with your details so we can give you uh, advance notice when similar talks of this kind come up uh, into the future. Also, uh, as we mentioned, the audio uh, and uh, the slides from the presentation will be on the Cancer Council website, so if you or anybody you know or love is interested to see those, you can refer them to that uh, uh, resource probably in about two weeks' time. You'd be pretty safe to, to hunt it down. So again, thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future Cancer, Cancer Council events. So thank you for coming, folks.